Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, and I recap live trials. So you have something to listen to while you're creating those masterpieces. Here's some of mine. These are my diamond paintings. I also crochet, watercolor paint, cross stitch. Um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I do it. I don't knit. No, no knitting. I've tried knitting, but I don't. Anyway, this gives you something to listen to. So Today, I got this, uh, the show is coming up early because uh, I want to sit and watch the Chad Dable openings. I got my banana. I've got my coffee. I am ready to watch those openings. Oh, yeah. It is going to be the circus that is Chad Daybell. Yeah. What a crazy case. And you'll get the full recap of that in a show later this afternoon. I'm also doing a live tonight at 7 p.m. Central Time. It's just a one-hour live where I show off my works in progress. You can see whatever I'm working on. Um, tonight will probably be a cross. No, is it going to be cross stitch? No. I'm going to do crochet tonight. Okay. There. I decided. Okay. <laughs> so, couple of cases I wanted to update you on in this episode. The first is Dylan Rounds. Now, I covered Dylan Rounds case last year, and I'll put a link to that video if you want to see the full video of um, that disappearance. He disappeared Memorial Day weekend of 2022, and he was last heard from when he was talking on the phone with his grandmother. He had set himself up on this piece of property in the desert and was trying to make a a farm out of it and he was doing an okay job but uh, he tells his grandma he's living in a trailer he's got a shed for his equipment and he's doing his thing and he tells his grandmother you know it's gonna it's gonna rain i need to put the my grain truck into the shed um he's never heard from after that he hangs up never heard from again so they start searching police start searching for him so after uh, this long Memorial Day weekend and nobody hears from this, this uh, child, he's 19 years old, I want to call him a child, um, not, nobody hears from Dylan this whole week. And so his parents are concerned. Uh, they go out there. He's nowhere to be found. He's not on his property. So they call the police. The police investigate and they find a squatter on this property by the name of James Brunner. Now, James had, he had his tent set up uh, not far from, I don't know if it was on Dylan's property or adjacent to Dylan's property, but he was squatting on some piece of property that wasn't his. He had himself set up in a tent and uh, apparently he was friends with, he had made friends with Dylan Rounds. So the police searched that property and they actually arrested James Brenner originally on a weapons violation he, as, you know, a prior felon in possession of a firearm. So they take him in and they start to suspect that he has something to do with Dylan's disappearance. They search his property and in a dirt mound that was behind, uh, well, it wasn't his property. They search where he's squatting and, and there was a dirt mound uh, probably hundred feet or so behind this tent that he's got set up that he's living out of. And there's Dylan's boots behind this dirt mound. So uh, eventually he's charged with the aggravated murder of Dylan Rounds and desecration of a body. So as part of a plea deal, and I don't know what that deal is or if there's going to be a trial or if he's just going to take a deal, uh, he led police to Dylan's body yesterday. So his remains have been recovered um, by the family. And uh, now that'll put their minds at rest. At least they have his remains and they will be able to give him a proper burial. So sad, sad ending. I mean, we no one presumed that he was still alive because uh, he had been heard from in two years. But in any case, um, the parents now have his body. Now, if there's going to be a trial on that, I will cover it. But 
interesting, interesting case. Now, the other case I want to update you on. Yes, it's still going on. Uh, the Arizona rancher. Yeah, George Kelly. George Allen Kelly, as he's known uh, by. So he... Um, still on trial. They, they did have trial last Friday, and I just found apparently originally long crime was covering it, but I don't think they're covering it anymore. But I have found some other uh, coverage of this trial. So I was able to get caught up um, on this case for you. So on Friday, the first officer on the, or the first person on stand on Friday was uh, the person that responded, the officer that responded to the second call that George Kelly made to the police department. Now, I will tell you, uh, George Kelly has been charged with the murder of, and I can't pronounce the guy's name, it was a Mexican who was coming into the United States, immig illegal immigrant, crossing the border. Now, according to George Kelly, he was having lunch uh, at the counter in his home. He heard a gunshot. He looks out and he sees five men. They're in camouflage. Uh, they're carrying large backpacks. Everything that he sees is telling him these are drug mules. They're not immigrants looking for the American dream. These are drug mules. And he has heard a gunshot. So he grabs his AK-47, which is conveniently located near the front door, um, just for safety's sake. You know, this is this elderly couple. This man's 75 years old. They're living out in the middle of nowhere on the border of Mexico in Arizona on this 100-acre uh, ranch. And, you know, he used this thing to protect himself. Now, I'm not a fan of guns, but I can see it in this case why he would have it there. He, there's no kids there. You know, it's just him and his wife. So he grabs his gun. He goes outside sees these people and they're fleeing as he's seeing them. And he shoots uh, over their heads and like warning shots. So afterwards he calls the border patrol and oh, there's so many sirens going off right now. It sounds very ominous. <laughs> I don't know what's going on out there. You know, rush hour traffic, I guess somebody got into an accident. Finally. Oh my God. <laughs> I didn't think would ever stop. Okay, so uh, where was I? Oh, talking about <laughs> the George Allen Kelly case. So he calls the police department. He actually calls Border Patrol. They have what this program set up where they have liaisons with the ranchers. So he calls the, he's got the number on the refrigerator. He calls the liaison um, and they send out the Border Patrol. And the Border Patrol calls the police. So the Border Patrol arrives, the police arrive. They do this cursory search of the property. And that's their words, cursory search of the property. They fan out. There's four sheriffs and two Border Patrol people that are searching his property. And they don't find anything. That evening, George goes out because, you know, his horse had been spooked earlier in the day by all of this commotion. So he goes out to check on his horse and he's got his two black labs that are always following him. And he uh, he's outside and he the, the labs are alerting on something. So he goes over to where this is and he's got his flashlight and there's a dead body. So he leaves the flashlight there near a tree so he can find this place again. And he goes back to his home. He calls again. He calls the ranch liaison, the border patrol, and they notify the sheriffs and they send the sheriffs off. So the person on the stand yesterday was this responding officer to the second call. Now the second call, he comes out and the cross-examination of this officer, I'm telling you, was so good. These defense attorneys are cracker jack. They are so good. They got him to admit that he kind of jumped to conclusions. You know, when he got out there, he sees a dead body. He didn't bother to, you know, he's treating George like a suspect and not a victim. Uh, there's a dead body on his property. And he's trying to say, listen, I was just protecting the, the, the scene and the crime scene is on his property. So, you know, 
we wanted to get a search warrant for the rest of the property. So George and his wife are taken down to the police station for questioning. Yeah, that's this is how they're treating victims of a dead body that's found on his property. This guy doesn't bother to talk to him about what happened earlier in the day. Yeah, just jumping to conclusions that this is uh, his doing. So one of you guys ask about the blood because the medical examiner testified in this case that the victim had been shot through the back and it had gone through. It was a through and through when it had come through and they never found the bullet. So they can't match it to George Allen Kelly's gun. So we don't know, you know, and George Allen Kelly's said, I heard the shot fired and he believes that this is the shot that killed this guy. So this officer was asked about the amount of blood on the scene and there wasn't a lot. There really wasn't. There was a fanny pack that he found um, that he was kind of lying on top of. He was lying face down in the dirt. Um, so he would not have been able to breathe <laughs> because he was just, his face was in the dirt. So he actually checked the body to see if um, there was anything he could do. And he said, no, he was, he was very dead. Uh, rigor mortis had already, it was already beginning to set in by the time he gets to this body. So the uh, next person on the stand is this transporting officer. He was the person who was called out to the scene. They have this program that I never even heard of where the Depart De federal government, Department of Homeland Security, subsidizes the police departments, gives them extra money so that sergeants and anybody that wants can do extra patrol shifts in rural areas and get the, and they get paid in addition to their regular duties. So this is what this transporting officer was doing that night. So he comes out there and he's called and he's asked just to transport George down to the police department for questioning. Um, and that, so now you're thinking, well, that, you know, so what, that, that's the extent of your involvement now? No. So when he's back at the police station, he gets a phone call from a guy calling himself Miguel. And Miguel said that his uncle had been shot by a rancher with a handgun and he was present there. He said there was a group of people there. Um, I was there. He said, but I waited for a little while. I hid in the bushes for a little while. And then I ran back to, over the border. So he tried to uh, get this guy to meet him at the uh, point of entry because he said he went back to Mexico. So the guy says, okay, I'll meet you at the point of entry. He, first he said, I don't know how to do that. So the guy walked him through how to do that. So then this officer goes down to the point of entry and notifies these people that this person is coming. He never got the guy's last name, that this guy named Miguel is coming to the point of entry to talk to him. But the guy never shows up. And uh, what he was saying is not accurate. We know that it wasn't a handgun that this guy was shot with. It was, it was a long gun of some sort. Uh, then the final person on the stand was an FBI agent who was in charge of doing cell phone extractions off of George Kelly's phone. Good luck, George Kelly. Bless his heart. 75 years old. He had an old flip phone. And unfortunately, the Cellbrite program that, these, uh, that the FBI and most police agencies use to extract uh, cell phones didn't have anything set up for this old, <laughs> this old flip phone. There was, there was no, um, no way for him to extract it. But what he was able to do was set up what he called a geofence um, warrant. And I had never heard of this. So it was explained to the jury. So what they, what he does is he picks an area um, and he picked the ranch, the area of the ranch um, and the shooting. And he asked for, a geo fence warrant warrant. So he set up this geographical fence in this area, does the warrant and 
what happens is whatever towers service that area, he's going to get a dump of just every cell phone that, and he, there were certain criteria. He says, you have to have your privacy settings have to be on a certain setting. And there's criteria for when it'll pick up your cell phone, but it would, it would normally come back with cell phones that were in that area during the specific time and, and place. This came back with nothing, nothing. So none of these guys had cell phones or George's wasn't on. I don't know. It was very strange. George probably didn't have the right privacy setting on his phone. I don't know. But uh, I thought that was uh, interesting testimony. Um, so at this point in this trial, I'm there's still a lot of reasonable doubt as to who murdered this victim. Um, I don't think that the jury is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt yet that George Allen Kelly is the one that committed this murder. The prosecutor is not doing that great of a job. And it's interesting because the, the defense, they're so good. And this law, this judge, he's, he's hilarious. He, uh, while the defense was getting some exhibits ready to show the jury, he's entertaining the jury by giving them law lessons. He's like, so who would like to learn what hearsay is? So he's teaching the jury what hearsay is while the lawyers are trying to get their act together. So I thought that was pretty funny. Um, anyway, so that is the update on those two cases, Dylan Rounds and George Allen Kelly. Now, there uh, I will listen to tomorrow's, to yesterday's testimony, and I will recap for you tomorrow what goes on in the George Allen Kelly case, which seems to be never ending at this point. I think they're in day, today would be day 10, or yesterday was day 10. Yeah, today will be day 11 of that of that case. Yeah. So, and they're, they are bringing in every single police officer that responded to George Kelly's property, which I think is a great idea. Yeah. Especially for the defense, because they're really pointing out uh, the lack of investigation that was done before George Allen Kelly was actually arrested for this murder. So, oh, I didn't, I started to tell you about the amount of blood at the scene. And there wasn't a lot, considering this guy's aorta was lacerated. So the prosecution asked the officer, was there any signs of drag marks? Like someone had maybe drugged this body and placed it there. And he said, no, there wasn't. So the only thing I can think is when he fell face down into the ground, that fanny pack that he had on um, kept the blood inside of him, if that makes sense. Cause it wasn't a lot of blood. And then the medical examiner did say he would have died very, very quickly, which would stop the flow of blood. So yeah, interesting, interesting case. So that's uh, that's it. I will be back later today in a second episode for today in which I will recap the opening statements of Chad Daybell Trap. So I will see you then. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care.